Hey everybody. So I had a request to go back over shader networks in Maya and how we go about creating them and um, different variations and ways we could use them. So I'll go back over the example in class and then I will come up with something also interesting. So basically we're going to start with a sphere, take it down a little bit in complexity, hit tap 5 to uh, uh, get us to a certain point. I'm also going to switch the renderer over to high quality so we can actually see what we're shading over here. And this is the hypershade. And again, yeah, on top we have different things for hiding different um, aspects. If we don't want to look at all of that, we can just look at this or we can do the split window um, if we have anything down here. So if I graph even the Lambert 1 shader down here and we want to get rid of it, we have an eraser up there so we can get rid of that. Um, lots of options for looking at things. Uh, but the first thing we're going to want is a new blend. So I'm just going to tap on blend, bring it over here. And as usual, we can see that it's got a blend shading group. And this is the blend node. All right. So let's start out kind of simple. And uh, I'll get rid of this on the side because we don't really need well, Actually, we will need that. Uh, what I'm going to do is middle click drag right onto the sphere. And that will actually put the blend right on there. We could also... Um, select the sphere over here. We can right click on this and say assign material to selection. Different ways we can go about that. And uh, let's just put a simple material on there to begin with. Uh, we're going to have the 2D textures and we'll put a checkerboard. The texture comes in, 2D texture. It's going to have two different nodes. It's going to have the actual color node and this is where we can actually assign colors to this. So if we wanted um, red and white or black and red we could do that right in here okay and the placement node which gives us um, the ability to do tiling uh, once we have a color file that we like or a texture node that we like uh, we can pipe that directly into the material a couple ways we could do that we can middle click and drag to here right onto it in the hypershade and then select color if that's where we wanted it to go. Let me just turn on the texture so you can see it's there. Break that connection. We could select um, the blend so we can see it over here the way you're used to and you can actually just middle click and drag directly into the attribute editor and again bring that up so we can see that. Um, multiple different ways we can go about doing that. So there's our um, texture for now. And uh, let's say we wanted to do something a little bit more complicated. Uh, what I'm going to do is just right click on it and say graph. So now we have the texture and the checker. Why don't we go get one of those utility nodes. And under utility here we have the ability to grab a blend node. Okay. And let's say we wanted to just blend something simple to start. Um, a color ramp. So we can bring the color ramp down over here, switch this to over there. Let's just break this connection for now. And all we did there was uh, click on the line and delete it. And we can middle click into the blend node. And it gives us the opportunity for two colors, color one and color two. That's what we'll be blending. So we'll pipe the checkerboard into color one. And you can see up here that uh, color one has now got a map assigned to it. And then we'll assign the ramp as well to color two. Now color two is assigned. Then we'll take the blend right into the blend and pipe that into the color node. And we have this truly ugly looking blend of this three color ramp and this checkerboard. All right, and if we wanted to alter any of the aspects of that. If we wanted the green out of here, let's say, we could always just tap the green. That goes out there and it updates automatically. In the blend right now, we're looking at the combination of the two. If we want to do change the color tags on this, so let's say we wanted to make that white and red, we could change that. Do that very easily right up there. Um, as far as a bump goes, maybe we could do something like that. Let's take the material down to here. Let's come up with a new file. And what we'll do is we'll do go into the Create menu. And if you're wondering where this is happening, this is the same as going up here 
and let's say grabbing a 3D texture and grabbing granite or leather or whatever we were grabbing or going up to the create menu here going down to 3D textures or 2D textures here we can also just right click in the work area go under the create menu and I'm going to go to 3D texture and pull up a crater texture okay and we'll bring that crater texture right down here like that for now that's all we're going to need so let me just make this bigger so you can actually see what we're doing in here okay so now we have this crater texture and I want to pipe that into our blin as sort of the um, bump map but you'll notice here this is a place 3D texture okay 3D textures are different than 2D textures as 2D textures in Maya, checkerboards, ramps, image maps, are going to be based on UV coordinates. 3D textures, their placement is not based on a UV coordinate. It's based on this gizmo in the viewport. And where you place this gizmo in reference or scale-wise to the object is going to be how the, UV, how the uh, texture map is going to be laid out on the object. So in our case, uh, all we're going to do is middle click on the crater, drag it up into the blend, and I'm going to pipe that into the bump channel. And if we look at this now, what we'll do is we'll just clean it up, we'll go regraph. Now you have this cratery looking sort of look on the sphere, which is kind of cool. And maybe we want to go to that blend and just look at a very cratery version of the checkerboard map, okay? So we have the ability to do that. This, as I mentioned, is the texture placement node for the crater. So as we move this around or change this, you can see where it places the texture on the sphere um, changes as well. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. The next thing to keep in mind is as we're doing it, let's see if you can see this, uh, because placement is based on the position of that grid, when we move the sphere, the sphere actually ends up looking like it's passing through the bump material, not that it's actually attached to it. Now there's a couple of ways to get around that. The simplest of which would be to simply parent the uh, 3D placement node to the sphere and then as we move the sphere around it takes the 3D placement node with it. Um, there's another way to do that but we're beyond the scope of this video for now. Uh, but hopefully that made sense. Okay. So again, um, as far as building up texture networks, they can build up pretty quickly. Um, here, if we look at this, um, we have a certain amount of specularity all the way around. If we wanted to limit that, we could um, pipe another texture node into the specularity channel um, right in here for specular color. If I take the specular color down all the way, um, we lose specularity and basically it ends up looking like a blend. Um, we could bring this up quite a bit and then we get this shininess across the entire surface. All right, so I'll put a little bit of the ramp back into it. I think that even just shows up better. Um, what you could do is, let's say we had this texture node here, um, we could duplicate these, edit and duplicate, shading network. So now I have the exact same checkerboard again. Let's say I wanted to, um, Go in here, and I'm just going to make this black and white. I could pipe this up into there and put it into the specularity color. All right, and you're wondering what that gets you. If you look at it now, the specularity or shininess on this node is limited to the white squares, the white squares only. Okay, so what it's looking for is the white and the black. If we reverse these, Now the specularity is only in the red squares, okay? So there's an awful lot you can do, but you can see very quickly how these uh, shader networks could build up and become very complex very quickly. Okay, so just in here, we have uh, a, a, a 
a specularity map, a, a two shader or two texture blended uh, texture map for the color channel and we are using this 3D um, texture map with this placement grid for our bumping system. And we have the capability we can change this thing out. We can make it bumpier still. This could be an animated effect if you wanted some sort of odd pulsing sort of an effect. Um, you can blend it in a little bit. You can actually add sort of a m melting effect and it smooths it out altogether as if it was um, ice or an ice surface and you wanted to blend that. So a lot of possibilities to do a lot of crunchy things. And again, at any point, these can be broken up. So if we wanted the specularity across the entire object again, all we need to do is take that connection to the specular map and break it. And we have specularity across the entire object. Alrighty. Um, let's start a new one real quick. And this one is something that might work. Um, let's just clean everything out of there. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create a polyplane. Okay. So we have a plane. Let me get rid of the grid. I got a couple of maps I'd like to bring in. So I'm going to say under 2D texture, let's bring in a file. Let's bring in another file and let's bring in another file. So I have three files here. And the only other thing I'm going to want is a new blin. Okay. So we have a new blin object. I'm actually going to pipe it right onto there. So we can already see that we have a nice shininess on there. Okay. Okay. And like I said, what I'd like to do is I'm going to show you uh, one of the maps that we haven't gone over, but you probably hear an awful lot about, um, is a normal map. And I'm going to show you a really simple uh, use and how a normal map is very much like a uh, bump map, but you have a little bit more, just a change in um, one setting at least that you want to work with. All right, so on this file node, what I'm going to do is go over here, and I want to pull up a file. I have a couple of uh, uh, game maps over here that I think that will work well for our purpose. And I am looking for, let's say, this one to begin with. Okay, so this is a color map. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe it into the blend and assign it to the color channel. Okay, so right now it basically just looks like that, sort of a stylized metal armor tile. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is in this one, because you look at the shine, the shine's happening across the entire map. That's not particularly attractive. Um, we're going to go into this next one. And I am going to grab the specularity map for this. And I'll just middle click this and pipe this into the specular color. Okay. So that's a little bit better. It, controls the specularity of the map. I think that uh, works a lot better. Um, the last map I want to show you down here is we're going to pipe and I'm going to do it in a different way. Uh, doesn't need to be a different way, it just could be the exact same way, just but to show you something different. Um, down here we are going to add the normal map and to view a normal map, I'll show it to you right here. This is the normal map that matches this texture. Um, this will actually affect how light interplays and the actual normals on the object. Um, it's a great effect and it's used very commonly in uh, game and interactive media. Uh, but one of the ways we can do that is just take this file here and we have a bump map slot over here and we can just drag this right into this bump map slot. Okay. Well, right now it's not actually giving us the effect we would want. It's giving us an effect, but um, when we, and let me just re-graph that so we get a look at it. Uh, in the bump node, it's by default set up to be used as a bump map, okay? And we're using a normal map, so what we need to do is change one setting. We need to go into here and change this to tangent space normals. And when we do that, we get a completely different look a much more pleasant look and this is how we get surface detail on basically a simple one polygon plane okay um, doesn't need to do one polygon it makes no difference whatsoever we could just up these right now to four by four by four um, 
but it definitely gives you the ability to look at this and say, wow, that's got some real detail on it, okay? And again, your um, network builds up sort of quickly. This is just a uh, color map, specular map, and a normal map. Um, but this is how you go about uh, starting to assign surface detail to your objects. And all of these maps are 2D maps. They have a 2D placement node, and they are based on the UV coordinates for this plane, which by default are just a big flat UV coordinate. Um, maps like this are used often for their tileability. So if we just basically moved the pivot point down to the bottom, and I duplicated this, move this off to the side, something like that, I could hold down V and snap these together. And that's where you start to get the advantage of doing tileable textures. So we move this up to the side here. Not both of them. Let's just move the one and hold down V and pop that into place. Alrighty. And so here we have this nice tileable, pretty realistic looking um, fantasy floor. Alrighty. Hopefully that was helpful. And that's the beginnings. There's a lot for you guys to look into on your own as well. We'll touch on materials a little bit further as we get deeper into mental rain V-Ray. But as far as building shader networks and working with the hypershade, um, that's it. Hopefully that was helpful. Take care, guys.